Hi, everybody. Yeah. Zero calorie fan. <laughs> oh, is that right? And how is it? How does it taste? Zero calorie. <laughs> you, know, you just try to lie to yourself. Hey, <laughs> there's sugar in this. <laughs> you know, walking through the halls with Louis, like walking with the Pope, everyone oh. stops him every three feet. Yeah. Well, that's because they have to go to the bathroom. No. <laughs> <laughs> This is a great time to be you. Everything, everybody's yeah, really cheering lucky. for you yeah. right now. Yeah, it's like almost like, oh, am I going to die now? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm a, I think I'm a little bit of a fatalist that way. <laughs> you know, comics like, oh, my God, what's going to happen then? Well, I don't want everyone to like me because then, <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, here's a guy on Twitter who hates my guts. <laughs> oh, thank God. He said, you suck, Louie. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, dead behind the eyes. <laughs> but it is, it is surprising that this role has brought out so much, not just attention to you, but this massive thing that I think people have been waiting to say for a while, just about how talented that you are. Oh, you know, I think that I grew into, which is a hard to believe, yeah. that I grew into this role somehow. Like, I was a terrible actor when I was younger, and I wouldn't listen to anyone. I'm a typical comic. Mm -hmm. If it isn't mine, it probably isn't any good. You know, comics yeah. have that thing. You know, if I didn't write it, oh, well, how good could it be? And um, then I got this part, and one of the first things I said when I got the part was, you're not going to complain about anything. You know, this is a conversation yeah. with me, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which I often have. <laughs> and, and then I say to myself, anything? Yes, anything. <laughs> you're not going to complain about anything. Uh, okay. <laughs> and you're not going to say no. What? <laughs> And that, and those are the two things that I didn't do for the 10 weeks that we shot the show. I didn't complain. I never said no. Whatever they asked me, if it was 15 or 20 takes, I just said, okay, let's do it. Yeah. Did you have any idea? It was really good for me. It was yeah. really good for me. But did you have an idea when you saw this? Like you thought to yourself, this could be that little spark that could be the thing? You know, when you're around people, you know, I'm from a certain era. Mm-hmm where we move in, we do the show, let's get the hell out of here, right? right? When I went in, it was I was I actually felt like I was going into um, maybe an operating auditorium mm -hmm. where stuff was going on that was different than I was used to, Yeah, where there was collaboration before, during, and after the shot, where there was a great crew that just discussed everything and tried to make it perfect and where the director never said one negative thing the whole time. Like that's an unusual thing. Yeah. Not once did Jonathan Kreisel say anything negative. He just said, well, let's, uh, let's try it again. And I go, okay. Cause yeah. I have to say, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. Of that conversation. And I can't complain. Yeah. So <laughs> you ruined all yeah. this. The <laughs> other me really screwed me up for yeah. this whole thing. But, um, and you know, I was in good hands because, you know, when you, if you know his credentials, Saturday Night Live, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, uh, Tim and Eric, uh, um, Portlandia, uh, Men Seeking Women. I mean, he's has hands in all these things, plus many more. And um, he was just terrific, you know. And Zach, who was a, the pro of all pros, and Martha. You know, I get to work with two comedians right. is always a lot more fun than two actors. And well, I consider yeah. both of those great, you know, like Zach's a great actor, but God, he's a great comedian too. Yeah. And very giving in this role to you and Martha that, you know, you guys get, you, there's a lot of comedians who want to hug, you know, every joke has to be around them, but he's, he's let you guys really shine and, and you both have. It's amazing. Well, it's his show. Yeah. So I think he wants it to be the best that can be. And that's an unusual thing. You're right, Ron. Yeah. Most people want, hey, let's cut his stuff down there a little bit. Right. You know, but he's praised me and praised everybody on the show. And, you know, it's a great new experience for me because it's the next generation of comics right. that I don't know necessarily. I didn't know Louie. 
I didn't know Zach. I didn't know Martha. Um, and so, you know, it's a whole group of people doing what I do, but, you know, now, which sure. is a whole different, you know, the, the playing field's different out there with comedy. Well, you know, you had your success very early on, although I'm sure it didn't feel that way to you, but you were a very young man when you got on Carson and got your specials and then went to Vegas. 31, though. Yeah. I just didn't necessarily look 31. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was a little, I had doing it. I had been doing it for a while, but yeah. you're right, in relative yeah. terms. Yeah, because you know. most people that are 31 are still, you know, getting, running to get somebody water. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, it's an amazing thing when you get kind of shot into stardom and then you're in your own place for all those years. I never got anyone water. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I never. I always got other people to get me stuff. <laughs> I would, I would <laughs> fake like I'm reaching for it. And they would go, are you all right? And I go, I'm trying to reach that water right there. Well, let me get it for you. <laughs> oh, could you? <laughs> could you? Yeah. I come from that kind of family. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Well, that's an amazing thing for you to be in a family comedy because your entire career has been examining your, your family. Yeah. My whole life has been, how can I take this thing that I grew up with, which I guarantee you is not exactly what you might think it is. Mm -hmm. But nobody's is. Everybody's family has their stuff where you go, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> you know? You know, if you're ever at somebody's house and you're in the kitchen, you hear them, you know, and they you hear something, you go, ooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, po poor Robin. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, and then you look through the, you know, fridge. And uh, <laughs> yeah. olives. I love olives. <laughs> But that's, but that is true. You've had a lifetime examining your family, and now with this character, it's kind of based a little bit on your mom and your sisters. Yeah. And and oddly, I hear from a lot of people, oh, I have an aunt just yes, like that, I or guess. I have a isn't that sister. a great thing? Yeah, it's amazing. You're playing my mother. Yeah. I go well. She's not getting any of the money. <laughs> I'm on cable. I'm barely yeah. getting paid the way it is. <laughs> but you, you must have been doing impressions of your family members as a, even a little kid, right? Uh, you know, I don't know that I did because I, you know, I did comedy on a dare. Yeah, I never had planned a career in comedy, so it was a little different of a switch for me. But my dad was a musician. And he always stayed up and watched Doc Severinsen because he yeah. liked him on The Tonight Show with Johnny. And he would let me stay up and watch The Comedian because I like The Comedians. You know, Jonathan Winters, Jackie Vernon, Bob Hope. You know, all those people were big influences of me. Johnny Carson. Wasn't that an know. exciting night, too, if you knew, like, Rodney was going to be? Because yeah, we only had yeah. three ca like three yeah, channels yeah. back then. So if you knew it was a Rodney or a Rickles night, you're yeah. like, oh, I'm staying oh, up. Oh, yeah. Or Buddy Hackett, even. <laughs> Buddy Hackett was Maggie amazing. Ha Buddy yeah. Hackett would do mean things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which you got, He's got the same family as me. <laughs> He's doing mean things to his brother. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, you know, so I was always trying to take the chasm mm -hmm. and try to relate to it. I can remember the day that I turned from being a kind of an insult, fat joke comic to a guy who talked about his family. I was in a little club in Minneapolis and I said to the guy in the front row, well, I, you know, I look at everybody, you look at everybody in the front row. And I saw a guy who was obviously with his father, you know, it just the resemblance mm -hmm. and, and I said, is that your dad? He goes, yeah. I go, you get along with him? Yeah. He's nice, huh? Yeah, he's very nice. I go, huh. Well, my dad never hit us, though, either. He carried a gun. <laughs> <laughs> and that changed everything, that changed everything yeah. for me. And so I got such a giant laugh that I didn't get doing anything else. And a different kind of laugh. And then when I came off stage, a guy, Roman DeCare, God rest his soul, who played a tiny harmonica. He was a very funny guy. Uh, and he'd get hit a sour note and he'd pull out a rubber pickle. And he'd go, oh, pickle. And um, which always made me laugh, even though I saw it a thousand times. And um, then he had no joke after that. <laughs> that, was it. that was it. Yeah. But he made a living out but of he, it. He, well, he, we loved him. So yeah. he was very, you know, he, I came off stage and he said, Louis, you know, if you do that, family material and you do a completely clean act because i didn't then you'll become famous 
And I don't know, sometimes you're listening to people and sometimes you're not. And I never had anyone give me any advice like that. So I said, huh. And then I started talking about my mom, you know. My mom's first words out of her mouth at a restaurant are, could we get some extra butter? (laughs) And the guy would say, well, let us seat your party first, (laughs) ma'am. And that that one moment where you kind of find who you are on stage is always amazing, right? Well, because then you go and you're, and all you're doing is writing jokes. Yeah. You know, like, well, how can I, oh, my little brother, uh, you're adopted, you know? Yeah. You know, they were frog face <laughs> people, you know? You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. And so it just, it just happened. I just, I just started, you know, creating this, you know, partially my mom, but all from a real place. Yeah. That, you know, eventually turned into my first special, Mom Louie's Looking at Me, which we just put out, believe it or not the 25th anniversary wow. of it, which is such, you know, that's when you know you're old. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when I started. <laughs> and then Kay, life, it bore Life with Louie mm. and then bore the books I wrote, Dear Dad, yeah. you know, and uh, the other books about my family, really. They're all about, and now I'm working on a couple of new family projects. And so, you know, I have to really thank my family and I'm really lucky that somehow I became the, you know, juicer of the family. Yeah. <laughs> but it, but you had to have been a, a real observant kid watching all this go I on. I think I was more of an observant, yeah, I yeah. guess, but I didn't know I was. Right. I would just like, the, the adults would talk and i go, huh. You know what I mean? I was listening. I guess I was listening. Yeah. You know, like the Scientologists. I was listening. <laughs> you know. For, <laughs> I heard something. But it's it starts, coming. Yeah. But it started to make sense to you that, you know, what was unique about your family and then what was, like you said, in common with all of us. There's so many, all of us have some kind of family secrets oh, tons. that we, that we keep. Oh know? my God. There's tons. Like, like, you know, you know, like you're, like, I remember when my mom, my dad drank, he was an alcoholic and he quit drinking when he was 69. I think he got a DUI and. It just was the time when my dad decided to quit drinking. And I remember my mom turning to me very resolutely and saying, I told you he'd quit. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I just said I just and that's and that's Christine. Yes, Baskets. that's exactly right. That's really Christine Baskets, yeah. believe it or not. A very determined there's no way I'm not going to win this battle. Yeah. But in the meantime, you know, casualties happen. Yeah. You know, we all got affected by that alcoholism. But in some crazy way, even though your father was a monster and he stayed with you, it, I'm less upset than the people who their parents split up. Right. I'm less affected by my father's terror than had and he be removed from it because I think a chasm happens to kids when they're removed from it. My friends who, they just go, oh, you know, they abandoned me. And so I guess you can get over abuse easier than you can get over abandonment. Or maybe I just could, Yeah, you know, because to have him in that, to have that, even though it was bad sunlight, to have the sunlight of my father being in the proximity I, there was something really deep about that. Right. But I, I mean, I only look back at these things now like that, you know, because I'm older, probably. I'm, 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 rem- maybe I'm not remembering it as accurately sure. because I think you try to, like, you know, bend your reality to justify your stomach. You know, like, I mean, you know, like, I don't even eat that much. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I even say that to myself (laughs) and I go, Louie, you eat as much. (laughs) You eat as much as you can get your hands on, Louie. You know, is it wrong for me to order two sandwiches Mm -hmm. when everyone else is getting a half a sandwich in the soup? Yeah. (laughs) But, you know, when you say two, it's like we're not just nostalgia for the good times. We're just nostalgia for nostalgic for our past in some way you know and i think we're just i think nostalgia is a really comfortable place for a lot of us sure and i just try to make money out of mine (laughs) 
And you have. That's you know, the I mean, amazing thing. somebody once came up to me and Louis Anderson. Nobody's made more uh, money on a with a screwed up family than you. Yeah, that's you know, true. and I go, well, maybe I don't know. Well, you know, when you read mo most people, like an entertainer writes a book in their early days, you kind of skip past it. Yeah. But yours are just fascinating, the, the the details, and that you turned so much of this pain into humor. It's very funny, but the pain doesn't disappear. There's there's always the pain is part of it. You know, it's like my book, Dear Dad. You know, they were letters to my father, ten years after he died, which is the weird yeah. weird thing. And I just, you know, it just came out on Kindle because Kindle wasn't even a thing right. back then yeah. in the 1800s. And uh, <laughs> um, like when people say, when did you start? I always go 1901. <laughs> and, you know, some of them will go, oh, Jesus. I, <laughs> I know. I, they don't quite put it together. Too. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. But, um, but I always thought that that book really was the turning point in my life. I was able to forgive my father completely. And I got to see uh, a 180 degree or 360, I, whatever one you want to pick, yeah. of my father's real life in his childhood. So when I, were able, when I was able to add up my father's childhood, it completed a puzzle and a picture that made me diminish my resentment, hatred. Sure. And, you know, and all my hurt from him because I go, oh God, he did actually a lot better than, you know, than I he than was a, I he, might might yeah. have done. You know, he was a human being. He wasn't a god or a monster. And you know, the, way, the day you see your yeah. parents as human beings is always uh, an important day. Yeah. And like people will say to me, I'll meet people and they go, I haven't talked to my sister in seven years, and I go, let's call her. <laughs> yeah. And I'm serious. I go, yeah. let's call her. Yeah. Oh no, we would we don't talk. And I go, you you know what? I'll just want to tell you one thing, and I'll just get off it. I'll say to them, you will not be able to resolve this if you don't do it while they're alive. It won't be as easy. And if you you what are you holding on? I always point out that resentment is a really is the only thing that really eats the container it's in, and it really does kill. It just kills people in so many ways, but it's difficult. I'm not them, I understand it. I had a lot of things with my family, but I never, we were not, we had to get it like, are you okay, Is it, are you okay? We tried to resolve it. Yeah. I'm more of a like peacemaker. I would have been a good negotiator to, all right, listen, you want that, they want that. All right, nobody's gonna have it. <laughs> I'm, I'm taking it. <laughs> The Gaza is mine. <laughs> you lost your yeah. rights. No. You're gonna be pay you're gonna have to pay to whale and um, at the wall. <laughs> and yeah. everybody's got You know what I mean? Like sure. you know, you just wanna take it's like two kids. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna have the wagon anymore. <laughs> and I don't mean to put it in those things. But my mom once said to me. You know what's wrong in the Middle East, Louis? I go, oh, what, Mom? I, I cannot wait. Um, they don't have enough hot water. And no soup. No soup. You know, if I gave you kids some soup and gave you a hot bath, you went right to sleep. There was never any fighting. Yeah. And I thought, you know, Mom... There's some real truth yeah. in your in your stuff because you know uh, you know it, it, you just, it's just amazing. Like I find it very you know I and I don't mean I'm not going to get preachy, but inclusion. You grew up in the projects. You grew up poor. They line you up. There were the project lines, you know, and they just told us here's where all the project kids. You guys line up there, and then the other kids. I don't know what they called them. But there was a name for them that, mm -hmm. you know, you own homes, kids. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then the Syrians, they line them up next. <laughs> no, but, you know, it was really, quite honestly, a big lesson for me that I go, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm singled out here. Yeah. And so that, but my mom was inclusive. Like if a kid wasn't eating enough in the neighborhood, my mom brought him. And why don't you have dinner with us? And she would feed the kid. Yeah. You know, even at sometimes when the parent would come and go, you're making my kid fat. 
Yeah. And she goes, well, he's got to eat. Well, stop feeding him. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I uh, was with you and Jay Moore, and he was saying when his wife, Nikki Cox, was a kid, Looking to get into something, you and your mom stopped the car, and your mom invited her in. To the and, limo. Yeah, into the limo. I was shooting my pilot. <laughs> yeah, and took her into the show and just yeah. showed her this fantastic time. And I'm like, who does that? The day you're shooting That's a pilot, oh, this kid needs to get in. Yeah. You well, know? you know, my mom was inclusive. Yeah. And so, and also, she shouldn't have done it. <laughs> 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 Am I right? I mean, no, I love Nikki. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but her name was Chrysanthemum then. And uh, no, but, <laughs> but you know, but my mom, like when your mom does it, you go, what? <laughs> This is my, uh, this is my time. This is my time, Mom. You know, like in The Godfather. Yeah. What about me? What about me, Mike? What about my time? You know. But when your mom, and that's what I do with Christine, also. Sure. To to her own end, you know, she will cause trouble. She'll. She'll go, I'll fix this. Yeah. Well, the well, the Easter show when she's pushing tables together. Yeah. And you're like, this is going to be disaster. Yeah. But her heart is in the right place. Yeah. Uh, but and then, also she wants, she's nosy. Yeah. She wants to know everything. Human beings are nosy. Yeah. And I come from a nosy place, the Midwest. Right. When I go to Minnesota, people say, when would you get in? What? <laughs> when would you land? <laughs> what? What do you mean when the, did you come in today or when are you leaving? Do you ever think you'll move back here? And I go, gee, I don't even know you. I'm serious. Every, every single time. When'd you get in? Let me check my ticket. Oh, yeah. here it is. Yeah. yeah. But just like I go, I won't answer him ever. <laughs> I go, you'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like for you being a kid in Minnesota? Was it? Uh... Well, I was a fat kid. But, you know, I was like, I think when you grow up in an alcoholic family, not to make people sad, but it's like growing up where a nuclear bomb went off. Mm -hmm. You can't feel the effects always right away. But you know something happened, and you never are sure if your dad or your mom is drunk. You know, not mm -hmm. my mom; she never drank. But whoever the alcoholic is, like when you go in the house, the thing you want to find out is he drunk or isn't he drunk. You mm -hmm. would almost be able to tell without anybody seeing anybody. You were so, you know, I don't know if it was an intu intuitive or you just believed it, and it happened so much that you were right, and you know you when you grow up in a family where things are rough, you develop all these really wrong things like yes is no, no, and no is yes. And, you know, you develop all, you develop all these mechanisms to protect yourself. You know, like you can never have a friend over because if your dad was drunk on the couch or in the chair, mm -hmm. you know, you didn't want him getting up with his boxer shorts on and go, Aah. you know what I mean? You sure. just, you were embarrassed. And so I think there was a part of me that was, I don't know, you know, like I, I can't, you know, I don't have a lot of vivid memories of being a child, to be honest with you. But I also think I held on to the great part of me that is a kid and got to, and get to live it every day, kind of. Yeah. Because I'm, I want to cause trouble. Mm -hmm. I want to see if I can get people. My dad used to say, here comes Louie. He's going to stir everything up and then he's going to leave. <laughs> Jeez. I don't, I don't remember. I got blame for everything. And then I would, but it was true. I yeah. was that kind of kid, you know, who wanted to, you know, see what I could get going. What did you, what did your dad think of your act when, you know? He loved it. He, he loved did. It. He was a kid. musician, you know. Yeah. My dad was really famous in the 1900s. Like in 1920, 20 yeah he played with hoagie carmichael who was a giant sure you know he wrote stardust and you know in that jazz era he was a jazz trumpet and 
cornet player, but I never got to see any of it because he was 50 when I was born. So it's like, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I heard that. In fact, I have a poster that says Louis Anderson and his orchestra, uh, like a woodblock printing mm -hmm. from the 80s, it looks like. Yeah. But it's really from like the you know, 50s, 40s, 40s and 50s. And it looks like me because his name was Louis also. So I, I was named after him. And not my middle name's different, but, you know, so I saw that poster, Louis Anderson and his orchestra, and I go, well, that's just like this poster's Louis Anderson comedy posters I have. And so I got to, you know, another thing, a guy came backstage once and said, hey, my dad was, your dad was my trumpet teacher. I go, what was he like? Oh, he was tough. He was a real, he'd really give it to you. And I go, oh, good, good, good. good. <laughs> well, you were probably a, la a slacker then. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, don't bother me then. No. Um, <laughs> no, but I was really grateful that yeah. I got that poster that we never had any of that memorabilia. It was supposedly a trunk stolen in St. Louis. It's always yeah. something like that. Sure. There's always a story in a family. You know, we were rich and then somebody took the patent <laughs> yeah. and made their own hair clips. <laughs> what? But when you see that poster, you see a man that you never really met. You see I a never different, did. different life. But, uh, you know, I also, you know, I lived with a guy who we would go to the grocery store and he would say to the checker, put that stuff in this bag right here, you know, in a separate bag. And my dad would drop that bag off to somebody who wasn't doing well. You yeah. know, so I got to see that. Who's that for? That's for the Johnsons. Mm. They're a little, you know. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know my mom. Yeah. You know, they're not doing too well. Yeah. and Just sending them some ham. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just feel better when they, you have a nice slice of ham. <laughs> Let's have ham when we get home, Louie. <laughs> All right, Mom. All right, Mom. <laughs> How about you, when you first moved out to L.A., yeah. uh, what, what kind of transition was that? Well, Jeff you? Gerbino, who is a comedian from Minnesota, one of the guys who really started comedy in Minnesota, I lived with him and his wife, Jeannie, in North Hollywood. And then I, you know, I wanted to get in the car. I only had a couple goals. I wanted to get in the in the uh, comedy store. Yeah. I wanted to have my name on the comedy store and I wanted to do The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Yeah. Those were really my two big goals, you know? And it's so funny what goals a comic has sure. compared to maybe what an actor has. Like now a comic might go, I want to get my own show. I want to do that. You know, we never thought, I never thought like that. I said, you get my name on the comedy store and I want to get on with Johnny Carson, the show I watch with my parents. So the guy, I... Got finally, Jimmy Walker got me into the into the comedy store, and then he let me write for him. You know, he did it with Letterman. He did it with a lot of people. Leno wrote yeah, for Yeah, Leno. Him as well. And you know, I was a terrible joke writer. Yeah. That isn't my forte. You know. Yeah. But he 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 just was a really kind human being. And uh, then I would audition for the Tonight Show. The girl who worked Debbie who worked the comedy store I said who's auditioning for the tonight show and it would be Howie or someone like that mm -hmm. and I go hey put me on right before them <laughs> you know so I can you know so and the guy I finally got my own audition and the guy said you're not tonight show material and you know your whole life just you just uh, you can do all you can do you're like Shaw. you like somebody took up walked up to you and shot a bullet in your, your chest mm -hmm. you're not good enough for this show uh, you're not johnny i don't think johnny would care for you and you just go what you're not you're like he's already gone and you're going what <laughs> you got to be kidding me i've been planning my whole career and for 2 years he kept me off the show he didn't like me He's gone now, Jim McCauley, God yeah. rest his soul. But he just didn't like me. Maybe he didn't like fat people. I don't know. You know, I always, th there's a lot of people who don't like fat people. It just is the way it is. And um, I don't care for thin people. So it's the same. <laughs> you know. you know. So uh, <laughs> it's not true. You know, yeah. extremely thin people have the exact same problem that extremely mm -hmm. fat people have. But uh, anyway. Um, so I got booked on the Letterman show. So as soon as I got booked on the Letterman show, 
the Tonight Show guy called me and said, hey, we'd like to have you on the Tonight Show. What? Because I was so, you know, I'm so naive. Yeah. But I knew what was going on. But they're so competitive, the shows back then. Sure. And then, so I picked the Tonight Show because, remember, that was my goal. So then, um, I didn't, Dave and the, the producer was so mad, I didn't get on there for two years. And I finally wrote, wrote Dave a note and said, hey, um, I think you would have even done this. Right, sure. You know, he I understood. said it was, and he did, and he had me on after yeah. that. So I finally got on, and that's the only way I could get on, and then, you know, I was really grateful. Well, what was that like? I mean, you have a lifetime goal of doing this show, and you're standing on the other side of that curtain, ready yeah. to walk through. Well, you know, first of all, it's a very tiny backstage yes. thing. People don't realize that. It's about this right up to here, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a little further, and then the curtain where you're going to go out. And then that curtain looks very cheap when you're there. You, go, yeah. hey, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I had, I go, this is not spun silver, <laughs> right? Yeah. But you know, I come from a place where my mom would go, that's cheap, <laughs> yeah. you know? Even though we were dirt poor, she had, she knew what style was. She grew up as kind of a rich kid. And so, um, and so, and then the band is blaring. And um, he goes, you ready? I go, yeah, I'm ready, 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 I'm ready. <laughs> and my mouth is really dry. I go, I got to have some water, I got to have some water. He has some water there. I knew that, so I had water there. And he goes, you, you know, and I know my act, really. I've been practicing it for a long time. And um, then the, the music comes, and the spotlight hits the curtain, and you're behind it, and it illuminates this room we're all in just unbelievable and you go jesus that's a that's bright you know but you're not expecting and then you hear hey welcome back uh this next guy is making his national television debut uh tomorrow night he's going to be at the comedy store at the dunes hotel uh please give a nice warm welcome to louis anderson right mm -hmm. and that curtain Hearts, and you know you're showed before the show the spot you're supposed to stand on and so you're trying to walk out and look at the spot and then look at the thing and and then I have one great advantage over most comics I am not afraid of a pause no I am just not I learned it from Jack Benny I'm just not I'm not afraid of a pause I'm I don't know why it's just who I am mm -hmm. um, and I you know, I always had a handkerchief, so I had the handkerchief in my hand. And I didn't own a coat. I mean, I didn't own a suit. So my brother got me a coat. Mm -hmm. And I had these gray pants. And to this day, when I see that clip, I go, look how fat my legs are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the weirdest <laughs> stuff you look at. And I came out and I said, uh, I can't stay long. I'm in between meals. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. And that was it. And yeah. I did this show, and Johnny loved it. And Selma Diamond was on, and mm -hmm. someone else, and it was we, they were running behind time. And so I did the thing, and I said good night. I didn't get called over, but I was heading back to the dressing room. And he goes, Johnny wants you. Go back out. And I go, where? Where to go? Where to go? <laughs> and I come back out for a bow because I got. You know, giant. Yeah. I can still remember going, man, this, that was a good one, Louis. Yeah. You know, and and, and uh, then I, I waved to him and he, he motioned for me to come over. I went over and shook his hand and I you can go on Getty and that's one of the first uh, images absolutely, that, yeah. that comes up. And the rest is a blur. The rest is like a blur. Even when I was out there, I was like a... It was like an out of body experience. One time, I know I saw myself from above. You know, <laughs> I go, "Get back in there! <laughs> God damn it! Do not screw this up!" I and then I, I also did it. I also did a really brave thing that I've always been brave about. I did an ad lib off Johnny's monologue mm. that I was really proud of myself because I did it to get back at. John, at Jim McCauley. <laughs> Jim McCauley. Because he said, don't do any jokes that weren't planned. I go, you know, fuck you. I'm going to... 
That's so I'm gonna. That's so <laughs> great. <laughs> you bastard, you. I'm gonna do a joke. That <laughs> you can't do it. <laughs> Uh, and I always did another joke every Tonight Show set <laughs> that I went on. Johnny was talking about McDonald's just uh, went over to a billion people or 10 million people or something. Mm. I go, I was just at McDonald's and the sign changed again. Right? <laughs> and Johnny loved that. Yeah, you know, he loved sure. that. So then I did nine Tonight Shows in like, uh, or six Tonight Shows in nine months, which is really... You know, I had nine prepared or something. Right, like you that. you had already had your act. Yeah, I yeah. Had, I had like nine or ten tonight shows laid out before I yeah. got to L. A. Yeah, know? because one of the I was prepared. I was yeah. a, always a really prepared comic. There's a, a a comedian that I know had this giant first tonight show was invited back the next one was yeah okay you the always feel one. it's not so good though the second yeah. time yeah it's like tough. i go that isn't as good as my first one right but it was as good in a lot of ways because i introduced another part of who i was with the family stuff right and then i never realized you know this is one of my big regrets i was a little full of myself you know i've always been very self-centered and egomaniacal you know, it's a common thing with comics, you know, especially with me. And um, I didn't realize how much Johnny liked me. And I wish I would have. Right. But you can't have any regrets about that stuff, you know. I probably would have made him hate me if he did. Really <laughs> yeah. Like me, you know? but hey, Johnny, can I take this home? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I, I've uh, talked to another great comedian who was very fond of you, and that's Joan Rivers. Oh, and yeah. to me, you know, it's so funny that those two kind of had that break because I always thought that they were just at the top. Uh, you know, I saw Joan pretty well towards the end of her life. Still was writing jokes every day. Yeah. Great jokes every great day. Great joke writer. Just Much better joke writer than me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I don't really, I really don't, I re, you know, like I write jokes according to, like I'll do this joke now. Yeah. I'll go, oh, guess what? <laughs> I had Fanta that had no calories. Yeah. Oh, terrible. <laughs> it's just horrible. <laughs> I go, you should never make Fanta without calories because yeah. it's just no good. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's just unique to but you. But that's what yeah. I would do, right? Because that's what would make me most comfortable. Yeah, and you know, I was part of the whole chasm. Did you know that? No, I was the first comic to perform for Joan. Wow! And so they were mad at me for a tiny bit only, though. Mm -hmm. You know, because I said I'm never going to let happen what happened to me with Letterman, and I never let the comedy store, the improv thing. Like, if I was going to go to the improv, I went to the improv. And Mitzi goes, were you at the improv? And I go, I know. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. I go, but you know, Mitzi, this is my home, so you don't have to worry. <laughs> yeah. All right, then. Yeah. Hey, Louie, start wearing sweaters. <laughs> what? <laughs> You're a sweater comic. <laughs> what? <laughs> It's true. <laughs> yeah. You're a sweater comic, Louie. <laughs> I am? But see, that's one of the things I think that maybe even your audience doesn't pick up uh, on you. And David Brenner, I always thought, was the same way. Yeah, They're just David. bullish to do what they decided to do. And a lot of guys might look at you or, or David Brenner and think, oh, he's a clean comic, so he's yeah. a pushover. But both of you guys, I always thought that he just does what he wants to do. And you know, I did, I was the first comic to do his show too. Is that right? Yeah. Because <laughs> I believed in, same with Arsenio, I did his yeah. show. I believe that comics shouldn't be uh shouldn't be what do you call it not merchandise but collateral or right. whatever you want to call it but shouldn't be you know you shouldn't you don't have any ownership over me yeah and i'm not i'm not in this competitive thing you're in because i never competed with comics either yeah like i i always thought well I, they're no threat to me they're not doing butter jokes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what i mean yeah you know yeah, yeah. They're trying to, you know, make a point. I'm trying to make a butter joke. Yeah. Well, you talked about getting into quiet places, which most comics are fearful. Uh, you do it. Uh, Newhart always did it. Yeah, he was a really so, good. So, 
amazingly well. But where does that kind of confidence to know that, okay, the room is quiet, it's not a bad thing? I'm so full of myself. Are you really? <laughs> I think that's it. Like, yeah. hey, if you guys don't want this, right? I'm not going to, like, you know, I, I learned really early on that less was more. And in Hollywood, no was the most powerful word. Because I learned the hard way around other things in Hollywood where I was too needy. But with an audience, I have to establish who's running the show. This is mm -hmm. my show. And I'm not a mean, I'm not mean or arrogant about it. No. But I'm, I'm, you know, you came here to see me. So this is how I do. I guarantee you, I will, I'll pay, I'll pay off my end. You'll go home forgetting. You won't think about your troubles if you, if you trust me. You know, I never said any of that or any of that, but I just, you know, I just, uh, I just was really real on stage. And my thing is not to force it, you know, with a joke. And I just, I don't know. I learned it from Jackie Vernon, I think. You know, Jackie Vernon and, and Jack Benny, uh, very under, you know, Jack Benny, if you want to go back and see some unbelievable, he, he had a lot more even guts than I do because he would <laughs> just stare off into the thing and, <laughs> and people would look and go, what is he looking at? What is he <laughs> you know? And um, and Johnny was really good at it. Yeah, too. Johnny. You know, he would look to the side and and do that kind of stuff. And so it just is who I am. I really am really good at one thing: stand up comedy. I'm really good at it, not egotistically, sure. but I'm good at it. I'll I'll go up against anybody you want. You know, I always they always put me on after Robin and Sam and mm -hmm. all these people who suck the wind out of the room but you know i was not afraid of that i was go okay well here i'm gonna follow this i'm not afraid of it and it wasn't always easy but it always made me stronger well i always thought that, that and i loved all those guys yeah. don't get me wrong I, and I everybody loved. all those people were fond of you too and that's what was always amazing to me is like what when rodney put you and sam on the same young yeah. comedy special you would never do that with music you would never yeah. like well yeah, here's yeah. a heavy metal band and a folk singer yeah you know yeah but you're you... saying i'm a folk singer <laughs> <laughs> oh well, my god so so's dylan i'm leaving <laughs> on a jet plane don't yeah. know when rocky mountain high. <laughs> Yeah. but did you you never felt like okay here's sam and or and dice was there at the same but time. i was horrified when yeah. sam went on yeah because i mean i didn't like i didn't know what to do i was in that in rodney's club and he called me we became friends i met rodney while i was still in minnesota and a bunch of us went down to this place called the carlton celebrity room in minneapolis and i said let's you know, let's let's welcome Rodney. We're all the comics. Let's go see him. And Jeff Gerbino, I think, really was the the catalyst again behind that. Um, I think I can't remember, but I'm pretty sure it was. And then I said, "Hey, Rodney likes scotch." I read it in an article. Let me stop and get a really good bottle of scotch. And I thought I said to the guy because I never, you know, I never touched alcohol because my dad was a drunk. So I just said, "I don't." Know. So I said, "What's a good scotch?" And he goes, "Glenn Levitt." I go, "Give me one." You know, give me a big bottle of that, <laughs> you know? And I gave that to Rodney, and he was so touched by that. Hey, man, what the <laughs> hell? Hey, man, thanks. And he brought it up, you know, for 10 years. <laughs> hey, man, you brought me that scotch. I never had anyone bring me anything. You know what I mean? It was really important to Rodney. It was the weirdest thing. And I, I did it because my mom was that person. So then Rodney called me and said, much later after you know he says i'm doing a young comedian special and i know you've already done the tonight show and you're really past this but i want you to do it and i'm going to put you on last as a compliment and i go okay and i'm thinking third third i want to <laughs> yeah. be on third <laughs> and every comic knows you want to be on third because the first guy takes it and the second guy warms him up and then you come out and go to the fourth guy try following that <laughs> <laughs> so you know there were 10 on that show i think yeah I there, think were, there 10. were 10 and um so sam comes out after there's a lot of comics and they're all good 
and Sam comes out, and the New York audiences are in shock. I mean, they're dying of laughter like we did. Like all the comics used to stand in the back and watch Sam because he was doing stuff nobody talked about. You know, he was doing a joke where he said, uh, when they shoot those things where the kids were starving, I'm sure the cameraman has a sandwich. <laughs> and you know, we weren't we weren't thinking that. That was that was forward yeah. thinking. And he crushed that audience. And I went, oh God. <laughs> hey, you guys have parents. <laughs> Hey, is anybody, is anybody like butter? Hey, cats lick it. Oh, God. You know, I'm so scared. I have to be honest with you. I was really scared because I go, I don't want to look bad. No one wants to look bad, do they? No. You never want to look bad. And so I just said, oh, Louie, just do it. It's no big deal. In the end, you know, but I was, I was nervous and I was thing, but I didn't know anything about editing. I didn't know anything about an audience regaining their legs or any, any of that stuff. And Rodney gave me the most beautiful introduction, you know, he just really loved me. And, you know, I was lucky enough to do well. That was a big sure. special for everyone involved. Yeah, was... Everyone involved, if they're not dead, is still working. Oh, yeah. You know yeah, what I those, mean? Those, those specials that were, first one. Yeah, that was the first one, and to this day, people still bring it up to me. And, yeah, and but I learned a great lesson that night. Go on third. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I hear you tell these stories uh, about being a little kid and watching the Tonight Show and and loving it so much, and then putting yourself not even in that television, but in that world where you could say Rodney and. You know, Joan, yeah. and all these people. It's just amazing to think. They liked me. You know, yeah. I, I'm likable. Yeah, you are. You know what I mean? You are. If you're likable, that's mm -hmm. a big advantage. I used to tell people, you know, that are comics that were struggling. I go, you know, I, I'm just likable. I'm not even that good. You know, I would say <laughs> yeah. to them, I'm not even like, I'm, not, I'm just me, but I'm likable. And that's such a big advantage. So I would tell them, I go, do as much stuff to make yourself likable or really hateable. I go there, yeah. don't be in the middle, it means nothing. Yeah. Don't go out there like one of them that's sitting watching you. Go out there like the be the biggest a-hole or the nicest person in the world, the most likable person in the world. Yeah, you know? I, th I think- And I think that, yeah. I didn't know those things early on. I was just likable. People like me. Well, they connect. I think people are, uh, you know, can will ride it out with you. That's why I say everyone is so happy for you. With I know, Christine it's, Baskets. It's really nice. Uh, and, and as I said, we're walking through, and you know, great comics are in you know in the lobby and wanting to run over and say hello to you. Uh, and people are all saying to me, "Isn't it great? What's happening for Louis? Nice. Isn't it great? It is great. It is great. Imagine if I were on network, how much I'd be." <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's the kind of thing I think of. Like, I mean, I love. Don't get me wrong. I'm no. thrilled with all the accolades, yeah. but right. I love cash. <laughs> um, no, they're great at, at FX to me. But you know, it is a d new playing field because I used to be the Louis. I used sure. to be the guy who was the executive producer, and I used to be the Zach. You sure. know, I was the t that was my show. And now it, it, I'm not, that's not my show, but I learned so much. I mean, I'm so grateful because, you know, I got to fill in a spot in myself. How often at 62 yeah. do you get to like, oh, I found the piece of the puzzle. Right. Oh my God. Put it right here, will ya? <laughs> oh, I'm going to lay down for a while. <laughs> I'm going to lay down. <laughs> Bring me a Kirkland, will you, kid? <laughs> <laughs> and to show to showcase this thing that you've been talking about so long, which is your mom yeah. and your sisters. I mean, what a yeah, what a nice honor for them. What a strange way to be able to honor someone too, you know? You know, yeah, I think it was always in my back pocket, but I had no part of this. That's the unusual thing. I had no part of this. You realize that? Yeah. This is a you know. 
Louis and Zach and Jonathan were together, and Louis said to Zach, well, and Zach had a, this actress, I don't know her name, a British actress. That's who he wanted to play his mom. She wasn't available, I guess. I should call and thank her. But um, <laughs> it was Helen Mirren. But, yeah. Helen Mirren. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think she should have done it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, and so Louis calls my agent, Steve Levine, at ICM, my old agent. Yeah. And I'm with Gersh now. And um, <laughs> um, he uh, says, uh, can I get Louis Anderson's number? And Steve calls me and goes, Louis C.K. wants your number. I go, all right, give it to him. Louis calls me and goes, hey, I'm here with Zach Galifianakis. I go, you are? <laughs> so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Tell Zach I love him. <laughs> You know, I didn't do any of that, luckily. And uh, But I said, yeah. He goes, we're doing a sitcom. We want you to play a character. I go, yeah. You know, nobody's called me in nine years. So, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't get the call. And you get yeah. that call, you're going to go, yeah, Louis C.K. is calling me. You know, the Louis mm -hmm. on FX that's won like <laughs> 75 awards. Right? Yeah. It couldn't be hotter. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's the hottest right now. Yeah. And also... You know, he he punched a hole in for everybody, in in the business. Sure, he he kicked a wall in, so that people can now get in there and make shows. You know, and people are, it, people yeah. are interested in comics again. Yeah. So, anyways, he he did something really breakthrough without even saying he did it. You know, which is really good. And he says, uh, "We want you to play Zach's mom." And I go, "Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it." <laughs> and he said, "We'll call you." I go, "Okay." <laughs> and that was really it and I did the pilot a year before we shot the show and we didn't know if we were going to make it we had to keep it secret mm -hmm. and you know I went there to shoot the show and that's how it happened I had nothing to do with this zero except how they did it was this way Louis says to Zach well he goes I have a voice in my head and then he made a ah! <laughs> or some kind of noise. And Louis said, you mean like Louis Anderson? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. He goes, should we call him? <laughs> yeah. And he goes, yeah. And isn't that an amazing thing? It's it's crazy. Yeah. And I'm just like, you know, I'm, I think my mom had something to do with that. Do you think? <laughs> well, I'm sure she knows Louis's great grandma who's up there. <laughs> And said, why don't you give the other Louis a break? <laughs> and Zach is Greek, so, you yeah. know, they yeah. go way back. <laughs> and, you know. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be great if that's exactly what happened? Wouldn't that be the most <laughs> What amazing? would be better? Yeah. And my mom up there yeah. going, you know, he's playing me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I had that same outfit. <laughs> well, you know, even when I heard the premise of the show, and I'm a Zach Galifianakis fan, I'm hearing he's playing a clown, I'm like, oh, this is going to be edgy and crazy. But when you watch the show, it is those things, but it's also sweet and heartbreaking and optimistic in certain places about humans. It's, it's a really, really interesting show. You know, Ron, you know what's really great? We live in this time where a tiny thing can exist that's really 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 special yeah do you know like there was never any fx right when we were you know yeah. starting out right there was no Nothing. fx there was no serious yeah right there's no serious radio yeah and what happened is that andy warhol's right everybody's getting a chance to shine and so fx and Louie and people like that who, you know, when you're on cable, you know, the whole thing is when you're on the network, you better get an eight, nine or 10 share, something big, you know, and they look at that and they better be 18 to 36. Don't have any old people watching you. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, and you know what? I don't know what we get, but I know we don't get an eight, nine or 10. The OJ thing does. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But you know what I mean? Yeah. And so look at that. Look at that. Because of that, and because the way people watch TV now is right here in front of them, like everybody can watch TV wherever they are. Sure. And we had to rush home 
see it and once. there was no DVR. Yeah, right. And see then we'd once. have to wait till they ran the reruns in the summer. <laughs> yeah, but we never got to. No, God forbid you ever miss Wizard of Oz. Yeah, it was the worst yeah. thing. You, it's the you got a year yeah. to wait, or or uh, yeah. it's a Wonderful Life. Yeah, um, which I always would say when they'd say it's a Wonderful Life, I go, is it? <laughs> <laughs> is it? Is it? Well. That that is also another amazing thing about your comedy because I've read the books and uh, I know how much loss and pain that you've dealt with even very recently. Yeah, and yet you still you still bring comedy to people. You still bring laughter to people. Well, you know, it's a it's a mechanism. It's a savior. It's a it's a you know thing. It's you know the the real truth about comedy for me is. When I would talk, even when I wasn't even thinking of being a comic, people would laugh. And I would go, you know, I'm being serious, right? Yeah. And then they would laugh harder. Yeah. And then I would go, what? I'm I'm serious. And then they would, and I, I never, and I learned that who I was or the way I did things was funny to people. And I think that's probably what saved me because people like funny people. Yeah. You know, they like people around that are funny. Well, I think we also laugh when you go through some of this stuff because we think Me Too. You yeah. You know what I mean? That we're, that you know, it, that's, we're in a Me Too time, don't you think, yeah. Ron? I mean, I was talking yesterday about inclusion. My mom always included people in the neighborhood who were not doing well. And if we are in a time, like, I see so much exclusion in, in the debates and all that crap, you know, that's on. And I go... Uh, we should just be focusing on inclusion. Yeah. And we should be focusing on art. And I'm going to tell you something that's a little serious. You know, there's an episode coming up in Baskets where they're shooting in France, in Paris. And while they're shooting this, a mile away or a few blocks away, people are planning on killing a bunch of people at that exact time that they were shooting this episodes of baskets and all I, I, I just find that profound mm -hmm. that one group of people are making something to relieve people and one group of people are doing something to destroy people and I just think that inclusion I just really give this a lot of thought I go are the people who are lashing out, they keep seeming to be people who've been excluded. So I, I just find that profound. And I and they left the day, the day they left, the next day, those attacks took place. And I'm so thankful none of them, yeah. you know, but isn't that an amazing yes. thing? Like, isn't that an amazing thing when you find out in history you know, what had happened. But I just find it exactly like Baskets is profound in so many ways. And and I just think, oh my God, we are not being inclusive enough. You know, like I try not, like I always say at the elevator, let's fit another person in. <laughs> I go, come on in here. And I don't mean it in any weird way. I just want us to... <laughs> I don't want to rub up against you, but I don't want you to feel excluded. That's kind of what I yeah. think. My com I think I think it comes from that place. I think that there is uh, in your comedy a place of, of pain and a place of beauty, and that we all recognize it. You know, yeah. and uh, again, I'm going to say the same thing that so many people are saying. Really, really happy for you. Thanks, and you're really, really deserve what's happening for you right Thanks. now and it's so great to have you stop by now. yeah it's great to be here and uh i never even knew this existed see this is what <laughs> this is what you'll find out when you get a hit <laughs> hey well, Anderson, i never everybody. yeah thank you all hey, so, much. So, thank you so much thank you money